not have heard before about four years and I retired a couple weeks ago. So that's why I think I'm America's, uh, that's about the best word I guess you can find. Okay, that, that, that's fine. Um, so I talked to Richard about, uh, I just have a few regrets, uh, about some of the things that we're seeing within uh, the national laboratories, within the federal government on opportunities, I think, to make some changes uh, around water and resources. Uh, so the first slide I have here is, is a slide that I've been using for a couple of years. Um, and I wanted to just kind of get out of the debate about climate change. What's it caused by? I, I don't know that it's a big deal uh, from a political standpoint that we determine what causes it. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the data from the Southwest, so which is also mid-latitudes, so both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. Um, we're looking at uh, these cycles of aridity and uh, water availability. Right now we're in about the 100th year of a 300 year arid cycle. So the issues that we're looking at from a national security perspective is that water is going to be a big driver for national security issues. It's, and if you really have a plot of water availability, availability, food availability versus economic development, the one that matches the best, that has the best trend is, is water. As much energy as you want, you don't get economic development uh, unless you have enough water to support industry, uh, agriculture, etc. So it's almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So when we look at long term for the next couple hundred years, water is going to be the big deal. So I, this slide is really set up to show that when we have these arid cycles across the globe and have in, in the past 2,000 years, there's always an abandonment of the civilization that accompanies that. Um, I don't know what the abandonment that we're going to see in this uh, cycle is. It may be Las Vegas, it may be Phoenix, Arizona. Um, but the fact is, uh, during these arid cycles, we have tremendous stress So uh, I think the issue that we just quit talking about is what causes it and we learn to live with it, which suggests that these water supply issues and development of technologies to address these limitations that we're going to see in water availability uh, are going to be huge. The kinds of numbers we're looking at for the Southwest uh, look like 50% reductions in service water flows, 50% reductions. Uh, that means uh, cities like LA and San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, uh, and even cities here in Texas are going to be having to deal with uh, water availability that's half of what they're used to. Um, so that's uh, kind of a background um, to put things in perspective. So where are we today with our existing water resources? And I, this slide I've used a, a number of years. Uh, I put it together, I got beat up by the Department of Energy for using it, suggesting that we were kind of limited in the amount of additional fresh surface and groundwater that we have in this country to meet these emerging issues. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the slides, um, we do not have any additional fresh surface water reserves available. We pretty much maxed out um, with our existing storage capacity. And in the past uh, three decades, what we've done is move for groundwater that we have not managed very well. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at not only the uh, Ogallala Aquifer in Texas and New Mexico as being an overdrawn or overappropriated, mismanaged aquifer, but most of the major aquifers in the United States are. So what I'm suggesting is that these alternative or non-traditional water supplies are going to be the, the new resource. So whether that's wastewater treatment, whether that's uh, reduced water, whether that's brackish groundwater, seawater, um, audible reuse of uh, municipal wastewater, all of those are going to be the new sources of water that we're going to be utilizing. So technologies that accelerate 
the ability to use these non-traditional water resources are going to be the big drivers in the next couple of decades based upon our research. So I um, wanted to just uh, show uh, people that ask me, so I haven't really seen that kind of issue uh, around water. Uh, you're showing me that this has been a hundred year uh, arid cycle that we're in. Uh, we've got another hundred years or 150 years to go. Uh, and I don't see uh, additional uh, use of non-traditional water resources. So I went out and looked at the literature and put together this slide that just shows that even though it's been done quietly, uh, over the last couple of decades, we have done a significant job in moving toward the use of these non-traditional water resources, and it's accelerating. So wastewater reuse is growing at about 15% uh, a year. Uh, desalination is growing at about 10% a year. Um, I had a lot of people say, well, you know, those technologies are way too expensive. They're not. If you look at how they compare to bringing in that next increment of fresh water, um, these technologies are, have improved significantly. But I think that there's going to be additional opportunities for improvement in this non-traditional water uh, treatment area that uh, we're going to need to uh, utilize. Uh, a lot of people said we don't do a lot of desal in the United States. Uh, desal, uh, coastal desal, seawater desal is not a big thing in the United States today, even though about 50% of the population is in the United States. But uh, the United States actually leads in brackish water desalt. 25% of the brackish water desalt plants in the world are in the United States. The largest brackish desalt plant in the world is in El Paso. Um, and it's getting ready to expand. So I think that uh, we have led uh, in the use of non-traditional water resources in this country. In the sense on the brackish water side, I think that we're going to see the need for some of the large cities in United States that are on the coast to start using non-traditional water resources also. If you look at the data from uh, University of California, Irvine, and, and a couple of other organizations like Sandia, uh, there would not be a water problem in California if San Francisco, San Diego, and LA used seawater, period. So there's a lot of, also, there would be problems in Las Vegas, uh, Tucson, and Phoenix LA and San Diego and San Francisco can be so also. So I think that we're in for some major changes in water management and uh, water use, uh, moving toward more use of non-traditional water resources as we move forward. Uh, I did, did a study uh, about almost a decade ago, 2007, 2008, and one of the things that came out of uh, this nationwide study with uh, water groups, water managers, energy managers, environmental groups, was that this very bottom one, the use of non-traditional or alternative water resources was going to be a big thing in the next two decades. Um, didn't get a lot of press. As a matter of fact, it was suppressed by DOE, but um, I can go into that uh, later. Uh, the other thing about that's up here is water use efficiency. Uh, really trying to minimize the use of fresh water where we can. Uh, and the last one is water resources planning and management. So additional monitoring, additional uh, improvements in efficiency. All of those things you heard this morning or earlier this afternoon. These are the kinds of areas that I think from a general perspective are going to be important. Uh, and so I think people have been realizing it. So now I'd like to go into kind of some of the technology areas that I think are going to be the ones that will drive the disruption and provide some major innovation. Uh, but I wanted to mention that the Department of Energy is in the process of developing a $25 million a year program uh, specifically around uh, use of non-traditional water resources. As way to address one, water availability for the energy industry, as well as reducing energy use in the water industry. I don't know if people realize it, but with some of the regulations 
issues that are emerging. The water sector will be the largest energy consuming sector in the United States within a decade. Uh, largest energy consuming sector, almost 10% of all the energy, electric power in the United States will be for the water sector and water treatment sector. That's why the Department of Energy is now getting interested in this. Uh, so I did the roadmap in 2007. They didn't want to publish it. GAO investigated me and uh, as well as the Inspector General from DOE didn't want to know why I didn't publish the report. They came to come to find out it was the DOE didn't want to publish it. So GAO said the DOE didn't need to publish it. The DOE said we're not going to rely on some guy from New Mexico. We're going to do our own report. So you can go get this report. I think it's online. It does do a very good job. All the chapters in there follow the chapters I had in my report almost exactly. Uh, a lot of the data is the same. They updated it by a few years. But I, I will say that I think it's a very good report uh, as far as where technology development needs to be done in the water sector and the energy sector to meet these emerging demands. Uh, a couple of issues that I'll highlight. Uh, this is specifically from a slide that I'm using next week as a keynote speaker for the uh, electric Research Institute, but um, process water reuse uh, efficiencies, uh, non traditional um, alternative water supplies, uh, alternative materials, um, decision support modeling and monitoring to allow you to make real time decisions more quickly uh, are all important. So let me just, um, just kind of summarize uh, kind of what I think where the disruption. So the concepts around non-traditional water reuse, I think those non-traditional waters are going to be the area of biggest impact and growth uh, when we're looking at 15 and 10 percent between water reuse and desal, that that's a big growth sector. If I go back, um, we're almost at a point where desal and water reuse are almost equivalent to the amount of fresh water we use in the United States on a daily basis. Surprisingly, it's that big of a number. It will be the resource of the future, I think. So new treatment technologies, uh, there's been a lot of work on innovative treatment technologies since the early 2000s, when I helped write a desal roadmap for the United States. Uh, we're seeing a lot of improvements, but one of the things that we haven't seen is the testing evaluation of those technologies to a point where they can be commercially available. Part of that is because we do a lot of this research in the lab, and so we make membranes that are about the size of a, of a quarter. They work really well, but we can't manufacture them. And I think that that's where we're going to see the program from DOE in the next uh, five years focused on is advanced manufacturing. So advanced manufacturing to bring some of these innovative technologies uh, to the market. Some of the things that we're seeing on advanced manufacturing 3D printing that you're all talking about. Um, what's uh, additive manufacturing? Some of the things that you can do 20 years ago when we were working in this area, you know, we could do some really uh, poor quality plastics and poor quality metals like sinter zinc. Can't think of a damn thing out of sinter zinc, but uh, we can 3D print it, so we, we did that. Now we're looking at Uh, all different types of uh, composites, which means that we can make pumps 